Uh, my name is Saad Ali. I'm a software engineer at Google. I, I am the tech lead of the GKE storage team. And uh, I work primarily on the Kubernetes project. I'm a co-lead of uh, the storage special interest group. So today, uh, the agenda is pretty simple. The storage subsystem, the volume subsystem of Kubernetes is pretty complicated. Uh, there's a ton of terminology, and if you're not familiar with it, it can get pretty overwhelming. By uh, a show of hands, how many of you know all of the words that are on this screen? <coughs> Should be at least one person. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you know some of these words? OK. And how many of you don't know any of these words? All right, cool. So I think uh, by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that you guys are familiar with all of this. And uh, I, we have a lot of material to cover, so I'm not going to uh, take questions during the presentation. Save those till the end. Let's get started. So one of the most important principles of Kubernetes is the idea that we want to make workloads portable across clusters. It doesn't matter what type of cluster that you're running on. The idea is that we want to abstract away the implementation from your actual workload. Now, what this allows you as an end user to do is write your application once and be able to deploy it anywhere. You uh, can write your application on a cloud provider like GCE, on Amazon if you'd like, or uh, uh, on your own on-premise deployment. Regardless of where you are, the way that you deploy your application is going to be consistent. Um, for example, you can use a replica set or a pod. You use the same exact YAML regardless of what cluster you're actually running on to uh, deploy your workload. The challenge now is with stateful services. Uh, pods and replica sets abstract away compute and memory, but they don't really address stateful services. The problem with state is that containers are inherently ephemeral. There is no way to persist state inside of a container. Once a container is terminated, everything that you've written inside the container is gone. Uh, and containers can't really share data across container boundaries. So if you have a couple of containers that are working together, which would be the case if you're familiar with the concept of a Kubernetes pod, you can have multiple containers that are working together. So for example, you could have uh, some, some uh, container that's pulling some static content from somewhere and a web server that's serving up that static content. Uh, you, without um, a way to be able to share state, you have no way to be able to share data between these two containers. So now, storage is a very big, nasty concept. There's a lot of different types of storage systems. Um, you have object stores like S3, uh, GCS on Google. You've got SQL databases. You've got NoSQL databases. You've got pub subsystems. You've got time series databases. And of course, file and block storage, and even file on block. Uh, so what, how do we tackle all of this? The answer is that we can't tackle all of it. We have to go back to the core principle of Kubernetes, which is workload portability. So what we decided is that we're going to focus on file and block storage and not on everything else, not on the objects, stores, the SQL databases, et cetera. And the reason for that is because the data path for both file and block has been standardized. Uh, your Linux operating system, your operating system basically takes care of writing block and file for you. So your application doesn't need to be aware of how to do those things. Whereas for the rest of these uh, data services, your application has to be aware of it. You have to have some sort of SDK built into your application that understands how to read and write from these different sources. And the problem is that there is no common standard for any of, any of those things yet. Once there is, we can talk about uh, abstracting that away within Kubernetes. So Kubernetes doesn't build standard data paths, but once a standard data path exists, we can do some really, really cool stuff with it. So let's see what we did with file and block. Uh, so the Kubernetes way to abstract away, abstract away uh, file and block is the volume plugin. 
A uh, volume plugin is just a way to be able to reference either a block device or a mounted file system uh, and make it available to all the containers inside of a pod. A volume plugin basically specifies how to make uh, that volume available inside of a pod and the medium that backs it. The life cycle of any given volume could be the same as the life cycle of the pod, or it could extend beyond the life cycle of a pod and be, be persistent, persisted beyond the life cycle of any individual pod. So this is the set of volume plugins that Kubernetes currently supports. I break it up into five big areas. One is remote storage. Uh, the idea here is this is network attached storage that persists beyond the life cycle of an, any individual pod. Then you have ephemeral storage, which uh, has its life cycle tied to a given pod. Uh, then you have local persistent volumes, which, are, uh, which enable local storage to be used in a persistent manner. Uh, and then you have these new out-of-tree volume plugins. And finally, you have host path, which you should never use. If there's one thing you take away from this talk, don't use host path. So let's uh, dive into this a little bit. Uh, ephemeral storage. So ephemeral storage is basically temporary scratch space that's stolen from the underlying host machine temporarily. And uh, it is exposed to all the containers inside of a pod. So you can think of it as uh, just scratch space. Uh, if you need to share files between two containers, you set up an empty dir volume. Uh, and it, any files that are written uh, on, onto that scratch space are visible from all containers uh, that make up that pod. These volumes uh, can only be referenced inline, meaning your pod definition uh, has to actually specify the volume type empty dir. Uh, you can't use a persistent volume, persistent volume claim to reference empty directories. And I'll talk about what PVPVCs are in a little bit. So the basic uh, volume plugin here is the empty dir that you need to be aware of. Uh, let's take a look at what that actually looks like when you're deploying a pod. So this is uh, a basic pod definition that has two containers. Uh, container 1 uh, and container 2, both of them mount a single volume, which is an empty dir called shared scratch space, into a mount path inside the container at shared. So if either of these containers writes into that path, it's visible by the other container. So fairly straightforward. Uh, and now, the cool thing about empty DIRs is that it does maintain this principle of workload portability. If I move this pod YAML that I showed you to any other cluster, it'll work in exactly the same way, regardless of the cluster that you're actually running on. There's a set of volume plugins that are built on top of empty DIR, uh, specifically secret volumes, config map volumes, and downward API volumes. Basically, what they do is create an empty dir and pre-populate it with some data. Uh, in this case, it's data from the Kubernetes API. Um, so for example, a secret volume allows a secret in the Kubernetes API to be exposed as a file to your pod. The reason we made these volume plugins is, again, a new Kubernetes principle, meet users where they are. The idea here is, we don't want folks to have to rewrite their applications to be Kubernetes uh, aware. You know, we want uh, your applications to just work on Kubernetes. So if you had an application that understood how to read some credentials from a file, we don't want you to have to modify that to then uh, you know, call out to the Kubernetes API and fetch secrets. So instead, what you can do is use a, a secret volume, and a secret volume will basically fetch the secret on your behalf and mount it inside that container as a file, and your workload doesn't need to be changed at all. So that's uh, ephemeral storage. Now let's move on to remote storage. So remote storage is storage that exists beyond the life cycle of any one pod. This allows data to be persisted so that you can actually have stateful services. Uh, examples of these volumes include GCE PDs, Amazon EBS, iSCSI, NFS, and there's a lot more. Uh, these uh, remote volume plugins can be referenced either inline or through a persistent volume, persistent volume claim object. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
Uh, the beauty of uh, remote storage is that this is what uh, enables Kubernetes to uh, be able to m shuffle your workloads around because it decouples your storage from your compute. So the pod that is serving up your service can be terminated on any one node for any reason. Either the node goes bad or there's too many other workloads running on this node and there isn't enough uh, CPU or memory available. That workload gets moved somewhere else. Remote storage allows the, the, the persistent state for that application to be made available regardless of where your actual pod gets scheduled. So now let's take a look at uh, what this would look like in uh, using it. So you create a pod. Uh, in this case, I have a single container. Uh, it's just a busy box container. When it starts, it's going to just go to sleep uh, for, for a minute or 6,000 seconds. Uh, and I have a volume, in this case, a GCE persistent disk. And I specify the name of the disk and the file system I want on it. Uh, and then in my, inside my container, I want uh, I specify where it should be mounted, in this case, slash data. And now when this uh, container is started, any data that is written to that path is then persisted to this persistent disk. And if this pod is terminated from one machine and moved to another machine, that data comes along with it because the data is independent of the pod and uh, is moved along with the storage. And Kubernetes will automatically take care of attaching the volume to the correct node and mounting it uh, to make it available inside the container. So all of the, uh, the, the pipe work is, is taken care of by Kubernetes automatically. But don't do this. Do not reference volumes directly in your pod. Uh, the problem with this is, what is this? Workload portability, right? We talked about this principle again and again, but the problem with the YAML that I just showed you is that it references GCE persistent disks directly inside the pod YAML. Now, if I were to move that pod YAML to a cluster that's running on Amazon, uh, it wouldn't work because there's no GCE persistent disks. If I were to move it on-prem, it wouldn't work because there's no GCE persistent disks. So how do we fix that? Uh, so yes, uh, uh, this pod YAML is no longer portable across clusters. So how do we fix that? Persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. I've been uh, saying that word over and over again. This is the solution to workload portability for storage across clusters. Uh, it decouples storage implementation from storage consumption. And the way that it works is, uh, your cluster administrator can be aware of the storage that exists within that cluster, but your end user shouldn't have to. So what your storage, uh, your cluster administrator can do is they can come along and create persistent volume objects within the Kubernetes API to represent volumes that can then be used by end users. They do that by creating a persistent volume object. Inside this object, they define the actual storage that will be used. So in this case, uh, I'm going to define two persistent volume objects uh, referencing two different disks. One is Panda Disk, and the other is Panda Disk 2. One is 10 gigabytes, the other is 100 gigabytes. They're both GCE persistent disks. If I happen to have two different storage systems within my cluster, let's say GCE persistent disks and NFS, then one of these could have referenced an NFS share as well. Um, so this is basically the cluster administrator going ahead and pre-provisioning these volumes to make them available for consumption. Now when somebody comes along and they want to use the storage, what they're going to do is create a persistent volume claim object. Now if you'll notice, the persistent volume claim object doesn't contain any specific implementation details. It's simply a generic description of the type of storage that the user wants. Uh, in this case, they describe uh, that they want a minimum of, minimum of 100 gigabytes of storage, and they want it to be read-write once. And so now, when the user creates this persistent volume claim object, the Kubernetes system automatically figures out what PVs are available and binds the claim to one of the persistent volumes that's available. <coughs> 
The beauty of this is that now your workload, your pod definition can now be portable. So instead of referencing the GCE persistent disk directly, the user simply uh, references the persistent volume claim. And now if you were to move this uh, pod YAML across to a different cluster that doesn't have GCE persistent disks, it would still work because as long as the, the cluster administrator has some PVs made available to the end user. So if I was running on Amazon, I could expose uh, persistent volumes that point to Amazon EBS disks. Uh, if I was running on-prem, I could expose a Gluster a file system, Ceph, whatever I want. So one of the problems you might have noticed with this is uh, having a cluster administrator pre-provision volumes. That is both painful and wasteful. Um, a cluster administrator can't necessarily predict how much storage uh, every single workload is going to use, and having to manually provision for every single workload is very painful. And so in Kubernetes, this is one of the unique things about Kubernetes, is we have the ability to dynamically create volumes on demand when the user requests them. So the way that this works is uh, through another Kubernetes API object called the storage class. The storage class, uh, by the creation of a storage class is a signal from the cluster administrator to say, I want to enable dynamic provisioning. So as a cluster administrator, instead of creating PV objects, what I can do is create a, a storage class that points to a specific volume plugin. In this case, I'm going to point to GCEPD and specify the set of parameters to use when that volume is provisioned. So think of this as a template for when a new volume needs to be created. This is, these are the parameters that will be used to create it. In this case, I created two sets of storage classes, one that I'm going to call slow and one that I'm going to ca call fast. You can call them whatever you want. Uh, for me, slow is something that's going to translate into a standard uh, GCE persistent disk, and a fast is going to be a SSD GCE persistent disk. Now, the cool thing is that uh, you could create the same exact storage classes on your own cluster, which may be running on-prem and has a completely different storage system. The names of the storage classes could still be slow and fast, but you can point to your own volume plugin and set some other opaque parameters. These parameters are opaque to Kubernetes. So you can pass through whatever makes sense for that particular volume subsystem. This is basically the way that we got around the fact that you know, these different storage systems are going to have so many different knobs and uh, things that we can't necessarily encapsulate everything into the Kubernetes API. So the way that we got around it is these opaque parameters. Kubernetes doesn't care what you put in there, only the volume plugin cares about it. And the cluster administrator creates these storage class objects, so the cluster administrator knows the type of storage that's running on there, and they can fill in the parameters with whatever makes sense for their system. And now we're decoupling the, the underlying storage from the consumption of storage. So now that we've made a storage class to allow the creation of uh, volumes dynamically, the next question is, well, how do you actually create a new volume? So as an end user, very little changes. You still request storage in the same way. You create a claim, a persistent volume claim to uh, a generic request for storage. Uh, in this case, the only thing that's different from before is that I specified the storage class that I want. In this case, I want fast storage. As an end user, I don't care whether it's SSD or not SSD or certain number of IOPS or whatever. I just go, you know, look at the storage classes that exist on this cluster and specify one to use. And once that store, uh, persistent volume claim is used, what Kubernetes will do is it'll go out, look at the storage class object, call out to the volume plugin that uh, the storage class references to create a new volume. Once a new volume is created, Kubernetes will automatically create a persistent volume API object to represent that new volume. And then it'll bind the persistent volume claim with the persistent volume. So everything is automated. <coughs> 
And then you can reference the uh, volume in exactly the same way as before, a persistent volume claim in your pod. And again, this is portable across clusters. Now you can also, uh, as a cluster administrator, choose to mark a specific storage class as default. Uh, if you mark a storage class as default, what this allows is the end user no longer has to specify a storage class in their persistent volume claim object. If, even if they don't specify a storage class, Kubernetes will automatically use the storage class that the cluster administrator marked as default to do dynamic provisioning. So it's a way for the cluster administrator to basically enable dynamic provisioning for everybody on their cluster. And uh, if you use uh, AWS using kubeup, we pre-install uh, a, st a default storage class for you that creates EBS volumes. And on Google Cloud, if you use GCE or GKE, we will uh, have a default storage class as well that'll provision GCE persistent disks. And we have a default storage class for OpenStack uh, that creates Cinder volumes as well. All right, so that was remote storage, and we talked about how to uh, use remote storage. Don't reference it directly in your pod. Use a PVPVC so that you maintain workload portability. Next, we're going to talk very briefly about host path volumes. Host path volumes are a way to be able to expose a directory on your host machine uh, directly into the pod. Uh, but there's problems with this. If you expose a directory from your host machine, what happens if your workload is killed and moved to a different node? If your application expects that data to be persisted, the data just changed underneath the application. Uh, so our recommendation is not to use host path unless you have a very specific need and you understand what it is that you're doing. Some people use host paths along with things like node affinity to try to uh, pin a pod to a specific node, uh, but you know, take a look at your use cases and see if it makes sense, and think twice before using host path. But this leads into local persistent volumes. Uh, local persistent volumes are a way to expose uh, either block or file from the local machine as a persistent volume. So what we recognized was some people were using host path to try to expose underlying storage from a host machine in a persistent way, uh, but there were tons of challenges with doing that. So what we did is create a new volume plugin called the local persistent volume, and what it does is allows uh, local storage to be used as a persistent volume, persistent volume claim. It's referenced in exactly the same way that you saw the GCE PD examples that I've been showing you. The only difference is that the PV object would reference a local uh, storage volume. Uh, the cool thing about this is that Kubernetes is aware that local storage volumes are special, so it takes care of data gravity for you. What that means is that once your workload is created and it's using a local persistent storage volume, if it needs to be moved, uh, Kubernetes is not going to move it anywhere else. It knows that this workload can only be fulfilled from this given node. That comes with drawbacks, right? If you're unable to move your workload, uh, you have reduced, uh, possibly reduced availability and reduced uh, durability. Um, so if you're going to use local storage, make sure you understand what the purpose is. There's primarily two purposes as I understand it. One is for building higher level uh, distributed storage systems on top of Kubernetes, right? You can t uh, aggregate all the storage available from each one of the nodes, uh, use local persistent volume to expose it to an application that then aggregates it and exposes it as network attached storage to the rest of the cluster. Uh, another use case is high performance caching. So if you have some very uh, high performance disks that are attached to specific machines and you want to use those as a, ca a caching layer, uh, that's a perfectly valid use case. Uh, Michelle is giving a talk right after this in this room, uh, talking about local persistent volumes in depth, and she'll do it far more justice than I can. Um, next up is, uh, let's talk about volume plugins in general. So the volume plugins that I've talked about so far, uh, 
GC, persistent disks, Amazon EBS volumes, all of them are in tree. Uh, what that means is that the code for these volume plugins actually resides in the Kubernetes uh, code base. And so all the Kubernetes components are built and compiled with these volume plugins and shipped with these volume plugins. The reason we did that initially was uh, to allow us to move very quickly. We didn't need to expose an API for volume plugins, so we could modify that API because it was internal. So anytime we needed to change it, we would modify the API internally and update the volume plugins because they were also entry, and whenever we ship a version of Kubernetes, everything was compatible. But there are drawbacks to entry volume plugins. Actually, before I talk about the drawbacks, let's uh, discuss wh why they're awesome, right? Kubernetes volume plugins are, allow you to do dynamic provisioning, which no other cluster orchestration system allows you to do. They automatically attach and mount your workload wherever it exists. Uh, and they provide a powerful abstraction uh, that'll decouple your storage uh, from, your, from your workload that's consuming that storage. So the volume plugins are awesome, but they have these drawbacks where uh, uh, they're, they're built in, built in tree. Um, so the drawbacks are that uh, they're painful for Kubernetes developers. So we have to maintain these volume plugins, and in a lot of cases, we don't have the resources to be able to actually test and maintain them. Um, they may have dependencies which we don't, we're, uh, we don't have, so we can't properly um, actually test these volume plugins. In addition, um, any bugs in these volume plugins can actually affect core Kubernetes components. So uh, you can cause Kubelet to crash if there's a bug in the volume plugin. Uh, and then because these volume plugins are built into Kubernetes, it means that they implicitly get all the permissions that we give to the core Kubernetes components, which is not necessarily something that we want to do from a security perspective. Uh, it's not just painful for Kubernetes developers to have entry volume plugins. It's also painful for the storage vendors who want to expose their volume plugins in Kubernetes. Uh, it means that they have to be aligned with the Kubernetes release schedule. Um, so for, for things like patches, they have to check into the main Kubernetes repository and cherry pick things back to the cu appropriate Kubernetes releases, which can be extremely painful and probably not at the pace that they want uh, to move. And it also forces them to open source their code whether or not they want to open source it. Uh, there are some volume vendors who would choose not to do it if they had the option. And so this is where out of tree volume plugins uh, come in. So you guys have probably heard of container storage interface. Uh, it went to beta in 1.10, which was the release of Kubernetes last quarter. The idea with CSI is that it makes the volume layer truly extensible. It allows volume plugins to be deployed on top of Kubernetes as just any other workload. They can be containerized and deployed using kubectl, create, uh, dash f, some YAML. And the benefit of this is that um, the volume plugins are now completely decoupled from the core Kubernetes code base. Uh, there's going to be a talk this afternoon by GU, who is uh, one of the co-authors of CSI along with me. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about it, please attend that. Um, the other out-of-tree volume plugin mechanism is called Flex Volumes. Flex Volumes was an earlier attempt by Six Storage to do out-of-tree volume plugins. The big difference between Flex and CSI is that Flex is an exec-based model, uh, meaning it, uh, whenever we need to do a mount operation, an attach operation, uh, Kubernetes will call out to a flex binary or script that exists on the machine. The drawback of this approach is that the binaries for the driver are files that must be copied to the node machines as well as the master machines. And that just means that deployment of these flex volume drivers is much, much more difficult. You actually have to have access to be able to copy these volume plugins instead of being able to deploy a Kubernetes workload. <coughs> And it also means that for a set of clusters that don't give uh, access to the master, so for example, on GKE, we prevent users from having access to the master. Uh, Google manages the masters for you. It means you cannot install flex volume drivers onto the master, so you can't do things like attach. So flex is limited uh, 
Uh, but we're going to continue to support it because there are a set of drivers that were written for Flex. Uh, the idea is that we'll keep it in maintenance mode and uh, invest in the future with CSI. So CSI's API is going to continue to uh, expand and uh, Flex is going to be maintained as is. And that's it. Uh, so if you have any questions, please, uh, uh, or if, if you want to get involved, please uh, uh, join the Kubernetes Storage Special Interest Group for storage. Uh, we have meetings every two weeks. Uh, if you go to that link, uh, you can find uh, details about how to join. We have a mailing list. If you have any questions, you can uh, reach, out, uh, reach out to us there. There's also a Slack channel. Um, for the bi-weekly meetings, uh, there's an agenda doc that is attached to the meeting invite. Feel free to edit that. Uh, if there is a bug that you have that's not getting traction, if there's a design that you'd like to discuss, just add an item into that agenda doc and we'll find time in the next meeting to discuss it. And if we don't, we'll just move it along to the next, uh, next uh, meeting. And with that, I'll uh, open it up to questions. Yes? Yeah, excellent question. So the question is, given the drawbacks of entry volume plugins, is there any plan to migrate the entry volume plugins to CSI? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the challenge is that the Kubernetes API has a very strict deprecation policy. Um, so we can't deprecate uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the API objects that we expose, like GCE, persistent disks, Amazon EBS, we can't deprecate those very easily. So the plan is not to actually deprecate the API, but instead modify the internal logic to proxy through to CSI. Uh, the design for that is underway right now, and uh, probably Q3, Q4, we're gonna start implementing that. Ideally, once this is complete, the end users shouldn't notice that it happened. They're still gonna consume uh, these volume plugins in exactly the same way using the same APIs, but under the covers we'll have those uh, requests fulfilled by an external CSI driver instead of the core Kubernetes binaries. <coughs> yes? For CSI? Uh, yes, yes, uh, sure. Um, so the question is, does the abstraction of CSI being out of tree uh, affect performance, latency, I.O., things like that? Uh, the answer for that is no, because Kubernetes is not in the data path. Uh, Kubernetes is strictly in the control path. So the responsibility of Kubernetes is to set up a volume uh, and expose it either as file or block into the container and then um, uh, get out of the way. And uh, so when you read or write from a file system, you're writing through the kernel uh, to the underlying uh, storage system. Any other questions? Yes. So, no mentioning of OpenStack Swift API in the public uh, No mention of OpenStack Swift API. Uh, I think what we try to do with, with I, I'm not super familiar with OpenStack Swift. Um, what we try to do with Kubernetes is evolve an API that makes sense with Kubernetes. Um, so we started from the user perspective first. The idea was to try to um, create something that would enable workload portability and uh, things like dynamic provisioning. And so we wanted to start with something that actually makes sense for Kubernetes. So we started with the entry volume plugins, and once we got that to a place that we're comfortable with and we see that it's working, we uh, promoted that to an external API, that's CSI. Yes? Okay, sorry, can I use packets? Let's follow up offline. I think we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me.